Well, from day one, when we set out, regardless of who the opposition was going to be, and then when we knew it would be New Zealand, the whole plan was to, to launch the stadium as an event centre and to make sure that when the event would be over, that is something people would remember and that the stadium would be launched into what is the commercial and world market. That was the target from day one, the fact that we had the All Blacks on board to do it was a great help. We were so proud of the new stadium. We saw it grow brick by brick through the, through the spring, through the summer and into the autumn. It was getting it was becoming more and more spectacular as, 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 as the weeks went by. Uh, but it was a masterstroke, I think, to keep the terracing on uh, all sides of the pitch uh, in front of the two new stands and retain the old terracing behind goal pole, goal, both goalposts. For, the, for the, the weekend leading into the fixture, we decided it was going to be a three or four day event. And we, we had a theme for it that was just more than just a game, it was the theme of the weekend itself and we got a lot of opportunities with the help of the New Zealand squad and part of the agreement they had with us to promote our brand elsewhere. So we used the New Zealand players to, to officially open our new interactive museum and our new rugby store at the stadium. And we used, they came on board on for a charity breakfast briefing on the Monday morning, which, which spread the brand and the whole idea of what we were at. Conrad Smith and Jerome Kino and Corey Jane were excellent players, they work very closely with people for autograph signing for competitions that we ran. So outside of the game itself there was a huge opportunity which New Zealand Union and management bought into to help us to promote our brand to people who maybe couldn't even attend the game itself. I just want to say it's great to be here. Um, uh, in New Zealand you look at world rugby, well I do and I'm sure other people do. We're a pretty focused rugby nation and Munster's one of the great clubs of the world. And it's just great to be here this morning and to be able to play on this park tomorrow afternoon and try and play some decent football and, and try to avenge the 12 0 loss in 30 years ago. You know, guys knew that it was going to be a, a great occasion um, to have a team like the All Blacks come over to open the stadium is massive. And then obviously, I suppose you, you automatically think of 1978 and uh, the monster victory over the All Blacks and uh, th that all rolled into it um, and I think for us as a group of players then we just want to emulate that as well. No matter what way you look at it, the achievement of the 1978 team is something that people will never forget and it will always stay in history and it will stay in the history especially of New Zealand rugby I think even more so than of, than of Irish rugby and they still talk about the fact that outside of the fact that they lost, the fact that they failed to score in the game and the esteem in which that team is held in in New Zealand I think reflects how important it is in Munster rugby and in Irish rugby. Excellent. Actually, this is my first time here, and it's actually I'm really enjoying it. It's as good as a Premiership stadium in England. Do you think that uh, the stadium has actually lost any of its atmosphere now that you've expanded so hugely? No, absolutely not. I mean, I think if anything, it's actually gained because I mean, I, the more people that are in there, I mean, there's, there's fanatical supporters all over Munster. The more you pack in, the better. And what do you think of Bowen Park? Ah, oh, it's brilliant. Yeah. It's really cool. I love how close we are to the action. It's fantastic. there about maybe an hour and 20 minutes before kickoff went out for a little walk around and there was still I suppose at that stage there was probably up to 10 maybe 15,000 people in the stadium already which is quite unusual you, you you wouldn't have that many normally. We walked out for the warm-up I think which is a full 35 minutes before the game the game was basically full at that stage and the lads got a great cheer going out just onto the pitch for the beginning of the warm-up and I think it, at that stage you realized that that something special was happening. Well, the opening ceremony, well, will we ever forget it? I mean, it was one of the proudest moments I've ever had in all my years following Munster and watching them play. The president of the Munster branch, Nicky Common, will come out and here they are now to officially open Thoman Park in all its glory. And well might the Munster branch, the Irish Rugby Football Union, and most of all, the supporters 
embrace this day because it is a fine, fine place fitting now for the team that have achieved so much. The Taoiseach from day one insisted that he would like to be part of it. He was some, he's a, he supports all sports, but he, wa he wanted to make sure he was going to be there. And I think that all helped to profile the whole event itself. Ball being delivered courtesy of the Air Corps. And what a spectacular sight. The arrival of the helicopter was one of the most sensational things we've ever seen. And uh, the crowd were really uh, agog because not, not many people knew that the helicopter was coming the way the, the guy shimmy down the rope and presented the ball to Donald Caniff, the captain 30 years previously. It was really fantastic. And that was something special, wasn't it? That was spectacular by any standard. What a moment for Donald. The heroes of 78 are acclaimed as Cohen Park rises. Missing one man, of course, who's sitting beside me right now. And we're grateful for that. But you can see it, can't you, in the faces. There is a huge sense of pride. Once the teams came out, it was just a cacophony of sound. You know, a lot of the guys playing possibly wouldn't have had experienced that in the past. You know, I mean, there was certainly, I suppose, there was some of us who would have maybe experienced that on the way to the Millennium Stadium and that in, in, over the years with the uh, Highland Cup f uh, finals and that. And uh, I suppose for a lot of the guys, you could see that. You know, it, it meant a lot and uh, I think it, it made them stand a little taller on the night. Um, and you know, the, the crowd certainly was immense for us in the evening. You could feel the hair standing in the back of your head and uh, we thought, well, you can cap that. But in actual fact, they, they managed to do so. They're stepping out. It is something unique. It is something special. Enjoy this moment. We'll never forget the hackers and the four, the four inspired, four inspirational uh, Kiwis who, who led the Munster hacker with the support of their teammates. The day before the game, we, we had a captain's run scheduled in Limerick, and um, you know all the Kiwis drive up to training in the in the car. Uh, Jeremy, Dougie, Mafia, and myself, and I just said that I was going to explain to the to the boys what what the hacker meant and, and what it was, and. Um, Doug just thought it might be a good idea that we um, that we do one to the boys so they know exactly what we're going to be putting out there for them. So uh, we just practiced um, lining up inside the change shed, pretending that we're out on the field, and we stepped forward as four. And then I just we turned around and I just said to the boys, "Well, we're going to rip one out for you, and um, and this is what we're going to be doing tomorrow for you, you know." And um, yeah, the boys were pretty pumped after that, and it was a good sign. Oh, just giving, getting a bit of a getting goosebumps now thinking about it. You know, it could just it was it was awesome. Like um, I've done I've done the hucker thousands of times, and um, I'll always remember that one. You know, it's really special. Like you could just feel the energy coming off the boys behind us, and um, looking back at the, at the footage, you can just see the, the steel in their in their faces. You know, Strings' face really stands out. He's just you know there's that calm strength underneath everyone. And uh, the way the crowd reacted to that was uh, just typified a wonderful evening. And then this, the way they stayed silent for the New Zealand version. Again, it proved just what a, a fantastic um, atmosphere was prevailing and, what, and does continue to prevail in Munster. The hack, I suppose, was one that I'll never forget. Um, first time facing it. Um, all the history that's there, you know, watching that as a young lad growing up and uh, um, just fit, and then having our four New Zealanders, uh, you know, doing the initial hacker 
um, was just amazing. Like you know, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Oh, I think everyone was in full voice because it was an event, it was a party event, we had the best team in the world in town. So I think it was certainly way more enjoyable and a much better atmosphere. As you'd expect, the field of Athen Rye will start us on our way as Paul Warwick and Munster get this game underway. We went into the game thinking that we could win it. Um, if you don't go into a game thinking that you can win it, then you're not going to win it. Uh, I don't know, did, did anybody or did many people outside of the 22 players that were involved believe that? But I think we, uh, we certainly believed that we could win it and um, for us, we just went out there and we gave it our best shot. Mappy to Topoki, Warwick, this is great from Munster. Colin, Topoki, Dunica Ryan, head down. We were confident going into it, you know. Um, you know, this, you know, rugby is a funny game. You know, you can you can have those matches where you know teams can play out their skin, and then teams can have their off day as well. You know, um, you know, we knew that they weren't, you know, 100 percent, you know, comfortable that they they played together for um, a number of games. So. You know, we, we knew we could get them on, on that off chance um, and, you know, with the occasion, with the crowd behind us and, you know, we had a good team out that day, you know. Dowling in the out half position. Now, Dunica Ryan, Munster are throwing absolutely everything at this as Dougie Howlett comes at pace. Obviously, it's a massive honour to, to captain Munster in any game, I think. Um, you know, then, obviously, you start thinking about it and it was just... Super, you know, it was a great opportunity for me, I suppose, with Paulie and Raj being away with Ireland. And for me, then it was obviously a, a massive honour and I suppose a good achievement in my career to be, uh, to be captain against the All Blacks. 10, 11 metres away from the All Blacks line, a foothold in New Zealand territory. Took Ireland a long time to be able to do that. A stringer feeds Warwick and it's Lua Tapoki in midfield. Stringer, quick ball. Mick O'Driscoll through the gap. They're on their feet all around the stadium, looking for something special. I don't think he gets the recognition he should be getting on a week-to-week -week basis, and that, that just happens to be the standard of the players he has to compete with week after week here at Munster. But I mean, that night he led from the front. Munster get up ahead of steam, and Scott Waldrum, the new man, is sent packing. Referee penalty to Munster. Given that a good thump. A great pump, it's over. First blood Munster, eight minutes on the board. They lead it by three points to nil. I'd say about, about 10 minutes into the game, um, Paulie got a couple of kicks, smacked over a great drop goal, and the place just erupted at that stage. I think people realized that something was, was on the cards at that stage. Is it there? Oh, I remember looking from the technical area at the bottom of the east end over into the west end. And, you would have sworn there was a riot on the far stand, the way people were, were jumping up and down and bouncing around. So it, it was very special. Best atmosphere I've played in anyway. Um, you know, Thorne Park has you know, produced some of the, the best games in European rugby and the best atmospheres over the years, but that one just, um, you know, bar none, that was the best I've played in. Any break and play just gave, the, gave a chance to the fans to really take over and make uh, Thorne Park their own. Like, and, uh, um, I think uh, it was just something special the whole night. Ball out, said the referee, and away comes to Eva once more. Dowling with the final tackle. A stringer held onto his ankles. Messam, and now wave after wave of all black attack. And Donald is over under the post. Yeah, I think we started the game very well, got into the lead, and I think the all blacks, we knew they were always going to come back at us. Um, they got into our 22 and they put, it, put a few phases together. And Stephen Donnell went in under the posts, and um, I think the, the the time of the game it was. We, we knew there was no need to panic. Uh, we regathered re under the posts and uh, said, you know, we, we're well in this game. If we, you know, down for the kickoff again and, and gain possession and try and build some more phases, so it was a uh, it was a time that we didn't need to panic and uh, just gain control of the ball again. 
Stringer poised. This place will erupt if Munster can pull a try out of the bag before half time. New Zealand get the shove on, but still the opportunity is there. Stringer, little pass out. Oh, yes. Wonderful. It's Barry Murphy, and Munster have that try. And this place has gone absolutely wild. We saw there was just a winger over there, and um, you know the scrum set down, and, and, and I just told uh, uh, James that it was just take a couple of steps and, and, and give it to me. And uh, you know I just had to, to see what the winger was going to do then, whether he was going to come in on me or if he was going to stay out in the winger. Then there was hopefully going to be a bit of a space for me. So uh, you know, thankfully he came in, and uh, it was just an easy pass to, to Barry, who finished it off nicely. That's that's nice, you know. What I mean, it was certainly a team try anyway, so I won't be taking credit for it because all I had to do was run five yards. Stringer hit hard as Murphy scores a try he will always, always remember. We needed up on the right if we were going to go to the short side, and Timmy did a huge job in getting it. I think it's not just Timmy. I mean. Um, the second row's behind him, the back row's on him, but uh, like his job is to get it up on the right and he did a huge job in doing it because that allowed me to get to Peter and Peter to get outside the six. So I mean it was it without question we wouldn't have been able to score without the Timmy doing that job, you know. When Peter Stringer sent Barry Murphy over for that terrific try, the only try to be scored against the All Blacks on this tour, well the crowd just raised Peter Stringer's it was Stringer, Stringer, Stringer. Not monster, monster, monster. Peter Stringer, of course, a great favourite with the Tuman Park crowd. He's kind of the epitome, the spirit of the, the little guy in the terrace, you know, that this guy just doesn't take a step backwards. And I mean, the hit he took in setting up the try for Barry Murphy, it, sh it showed the, the punishment he was willing to take. Like, I mean, he, he got levelled that time when the tackle went in, and yet it didn't matter. All it was was about getting the pass out so Barry Murphy got in the corner, and sure. It was a two on one, and, and you know, that's what you. You go through in training, uh, week in, week out. It's a simple, you know, if a man steps in, you give the pass. It was nice to, to see Barry touch the ball down. And Cody Jane runs it in, and Munster finished the half on the front foot. What about that for 40 minutes of rugby? Wonderful stuff. One of the things that struck a chord with me as the game went on was. I kept looking at my watch as the boys scored and you know they got this great drive through Barry Murphy and then Paul Warwick dropped that fantastic goal and uh, Paul was putting over the points and we were leading 16-10 at half time. Kept looking at your watch and you're saying, this reminds me of 1978. We took the face off the watch that day as well, saying, good lord, these guys are well ahead. Could it be that they're going to win this match? There were similarities really in the frantic nature of the game itself, that's what I kept saying to myself. The idea where guys were making tackles that they wouldn't make any other week in the year. They were playing for the people that were in the crowd. They were playing against the best team in the world. So there were actually a lot of similarities. I think at half time, guys started maybe to believe more so that we could actually win this game. Um, you know, there was, there, was, there was a lot of things being said. You know, people were listening to what was going on. and. I think at that stage, guys realised that there was only you know 40 minutes to go, and that you know anything was possible. The feeling was that this game is on. You know, that there's no whitewash on here at all. I mean, the lads obviously would have been fearing that coming up against New Zealand what was considered by, by many to be our second side, that, that there could be 40, 50 points in it. I think going in on top, the lads realised that, look, there's a real game on here, there's a real chance, and there was just that belief was seeping into the side, I think. About to get underway with Stephen Donald. This game, for some reason, really, really captured the imagination of the public, and the thought that Munster were going to beat the All Blacks for the second time uh, captured the imagination to a, an enormous extent. Back inside the ball comes relentless pressure from New Zealand, relentless tackling from Munster. They have the advantage. I think they're going to need it. Slightly isolated now. And the referee agrees and he brings it back. But the tackling is what's causing the turnovers. Yeah, and it's all pressure. I, you know, I can't emphasise enough. The crowd are lifting the team. This is when they need the most of all. I mean, what an atmosphere here in this ground. It is absolutely electric. I hope it's coming across at home.
we put pressure on them and they did make mistakes and we kind of seen that and Tony showed, showed it to us in the videos during the week that you know, if you do put pressure on them they, they are human, they can make mistakes and I suppose that's the only way we had a chance to do it, you know, was pressure. I think that game would have given a lot of our, our younger players, players who, who are not always in the front line, a, a great amount of belief. I mean, there was plenty of young lads there who, who performed very, very well. Timmy Ryan, obviously, in the front row, did really well. And Billy Holland, Niall Ronan, all these guys were Trojans. James Coughlin, I thought, I thought our back row was absolutely brilliant on the night. 15,000 seats, I think, in Thoma Park nowadays, but they weren't needed that night because we were all on the edge of our seats. And uh, as I say, you, 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 um, you hoped and you believed and you trusted that somehow these guys could hold on. They were out on their feet. I think it was five guys who were down at one stage. Again, I suppose the thing for maybe the 15 that were on the pitch, a lot of us hadn't, haven't played an awful lot of rugby yet this season, or certainly played rugby at that, at that intensity this season. So, you know, for a lot of us, it was, uh, it was, it was a bit of a shock to the system. And um, I, think, uh, I think it showed on the pitch. I'd say fully 25 minutes from the end of the game, I can remember looking onto the pitch and thinking we we're in real trouble here because the lads are given absolutely everything and there's not much left out there. You know, I've sort of, at that stage, was fearing we could ship another, another 20 points if we didn't watch out. But um, fair play to the lads, stuck to the guns, tackled like Trojans right throughout and, and never gave up. To the back and the Fini Mafia is a terrific tackle on Corey Jane. No, I, th I think that uh, possibly we, uh, s some guys, you know, who, who possibly weren't used to that intensity, it just, just became a, bit, a little too much by the end, you know. New Zealand look to mess him once more. Ball pops out, Joe Driscoll tries to come through, but he says that he came in from the side. Uh, Mick O'Driscoll, that would seem a little harsh because it looked again like the ball was out, but it... O'Driscoll came in from the side, he can't believe it. Well, I said in my, in my report in the Examiner the following day that I, one thing I really dislike doing is cr uh, slagging off referees, especially when your home team has lost an, uh, by a narrow margin. It smacks of sour grapes not being able to take your beating. But I do believe that the French referee on this occasion was harsh and monstrous in the fact that I, th I believe he refereed only one team, especially in the second half. And... Uh, Every 50-50 decision went against Munster, went in favour of the All Blacks. Was Mikko offside? <sighs> Probably not. The total rough justice, the fact that the penalty that turned the game in New Zealand's favour at the end, the one that kicked the touch to set up the line out, happened, he, he was the guy at fault. And I mean, if the, there was ever an injustice, that, that, that was it. Like, and I mean, it was, it was very debatable as well that the ball that the ball, the ball wasn't out, he was out according to the, looking at it there. And you could see the, the pain and anguish in his face when he reacted to the referee's decision. It was just it's cruel, it shows you how sport can be, cru be so cruel. And the referee allows a free to all. And the All Blacks continue to hold on to possession. Deep inside the last five minutes. Now the opportunity is Rokotoko gets himself in space. It's Howland who's there, Rokotoko! Stringer could do nothing. And the big man scores the try. When you saw Rocket Cocker going over the corner, what was your, what was your reaction? Bollocks. <laughs> 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 well, in the commentary, um, I just said, it's a try. It's a try. It's a try. <laughs> I see you're disappointed, but I mean, there was still four minutes left. So at that stage, it was just all about getting back up the pitch and getting, you know, Worst case scenario, a shot at a, a drop goal. Um, but we just needed to win the ball. We needed to get the ball back. So at that stage, we knew we were kicking off short into them. So we went up, we contested. Unfortunately, I think they won it, but we, we turned it over and possibly turned it over again. So we, we, did, we did have the opportunities, but unfortunately, we just weren't able to take They'll do anything for it at this point. They have it through Stringer. Maybe one last throw of the dice. Warwick though kicks the ball away. All the decisions have been so right from the man all night. And then there's that and it's gone. But what a game and what an occasion. And when the disappointment has passed, it'll live long in the memory. You know, you're tired, you're, you're wrecked the whole way through the game. It was just, it was so fast, but the second the whistle went, it was like everything, your all energy is drained out of you. You're just completely, you're just wrecked, lying, lying there on the ground, hard to get up. 
the aftermatch uh, attitude of the two sides. I mean, the Munster players who for 77 minutes had given their all, well, they gave it for 80 minutes, but for 77 minutes were in, were in, were in top in the match, had played wonderfully well. And they, a lot of, most of them threw themselves to the ground. There are, there are um, poignant pictures of people like Freddie Pucciarello and Frankie Sheehan embracing and, uh, you know, their disappointments etched deeply into their faces. But um, the way they then picked themselves up and walked around the pitch and acknowledged the way the crowd had, had, had cheered them on and played, been uh, a, the 16th man, as we so often refer to, that was fantastic. And the singing again was wonderful. And then the All Blacks came out the way they came out and acknowledged the entire atmosphere of a wonderful occasion. That was also inspiring. With the support that we got, even at the end of the game, the applause, everything, you know, I think guys were, were a little taken aback by that. Um, obviously, it was a, you know, a monumental effort by all the lads on the pitch, but I suppose at the end of the, at the, end of the day, for us, as professional sports people, you want to win games, you know, finishing... Obviously, finishing second doesn't doesn't count for anything in this game, and unfortunately, on the night that's what happened. But um, I think guys were guys were very proud of of what we achieved, but yet still very very disappointed at the outcome of the of the game. Well, we should have won it. That's the bottom line. Like you know, um, it'll be great to be looked back on, on the occasion. You know, in years to come, it was you know I suppose uh, you know a morale boosting performance for everyone, but. Um, you know, we let it go. We, you know, we should have finished that game out. You know, we'd, we'd worked so hard for 80 minutes. Not one guy out there had any more to give. And, yeah, it was just, I, th I think that's the aspect of it, you know, that, that um, really got to me was that it was just um, 15, 22 guys, you know, and, and they really did, they really did give it everything. And there's not many times you can say that. Obviously, it was a, an unbelievable occasion. Um, and I think their try at the very end will, will kind of stand out and, and I think maybe in, 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 in a while looking, at it, looking back at it, um, the overriding factor may be our determination, our passion on the day, the supporters and everything will, will, will you know, rise to the top. But it's, it's still quite sickening thinking of, of, of how close we actually got and, and to, to, you know, to, to feel the, them scoring in, in the last few minutes. Um, having given it everything. And I know the guys couldn't have given it any more and I suppose that's one satisfying thing that guys were out of their feet looking at them in the dressing room after the game. Guys physically couldn't, give them, uh, couldn't have given another inch. You know, obviously guys are gutted. Maybe if you told guys before the match we'd lose by two points, they might have been happy with that. But when you get your nose in front at all, and you know, I suppose it's a credit to this organisation, Munster, that's what we are. We're, we're here to win. Um, you know, we represent all these people around. We represent, you know, our families and friends and, and, you know, it's a credit to us that the disappointment that was inside in that dressing room behind me, you know. Oh, I just think it was a great game of rugby. I think the Munster boys should be exceptionally proud of themselves. I thought they played superbly. There's a lot of spirit in this, in this town, a lot of spirit in this rugby club, and it lived up to all expectations. We thought we were in for a hell of a game, and we were, and fortunately enough, we came away with a win. The feeling, having just come off from that game, I, I know we lost, but a massive sense of pride in what the lads managed to achieve, basically against all odds, against... Uh, a New Zealand side and managed to pull out that performance you know I know we didn't win but at the end of the day it wasn't really about the result it was about the occasion and the event. Well it, it, it says it said so much about the, uh, the whole occasion itself that it wasn't about the winning and losing at the end of the day like you know that it was about the event it wasn't Sean Limerick off in its best light Sean Munster off in its best light. Well I have a son living down in New Zealand and he says that he's going around proudly with his Munster jersey and everyone is just coming up to him and, and shaking, shaking his hand Monster back on the map and back on the map in a big way. We've achieved what we set out to do and probably achieved beyond what we sent out to do, that it was a fantastic event that launched the stadium and the performance of the team was beyond what anyone could have expected. I think it's a special one that I'll always remember. It goes down in folklore history, like, you know, for, you know, the occasion that it was. I mean, I've been walking around Limerick for the last couple of weeks and people have been telling me congratulations, you know, and, and last week and, you know, when you, when you lose a match and someone tells you that, it's, you know, it's a something up. So it was something special, you know, and I'll always remember for that. I haven't seen anything like this ever. You can play in New Zealand teams and you can win tournaments and you can win games by plenty of points and you still get taken to pieces, you know. But you, you play for months then, and, and when you're down, you know, you, your public and your people and, and your teammates pick you up. I think that's, that's a big difference, you know. Um, 
we really are a part of the community here. Oh, it's an awesome stadium. Um, <clears throat> you know, it just gets better and better. Uh, running out there now today, and the hairs were sticking up in the back of my head. Places I never even knew I had hairs, and um, awesome. I mean, the crowd are fantastic. Um, you know, a credit to the people who put this whole thing together. We have a stadium to host events of that thing. We have a team, and we have a structure, and we have a brand that can commercially host and and uh, promote a fixture of that nature, so certainly that's where we want to go to in the future.